A very good morning to all of you. We warmly welcome you for today's session of our webinar, which is jointly organized by the GMOA and the Government Medical Association and the Society for Health Research and Innovation. And before I get into our topic today, I would like to get to know you and invite you all today for this Sunday morning and to remind you of some of the housekeeping rules. Please kindly mute your microphones and also switch off your cameras to avoid any interference. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. So kindly input your ideas and your queries in the chat box for us to discuss at the end. And also this webinar link will be available until 9.45 to join in and no late attendees will be entertained. At the end of the seminar, there will be a certificate issued for you and the link will be posted. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. P. Prashant, who is the acting, uh, who is currently the consultant emergency physician attached to base hospital Panadura, and he will be entertaining us and enlightening us today on hyperglycemic emergencies and will be mostly focusing on DKA and HHS. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Romali, for a kind introduction. And thank you, GMO and Sri, for uh, giving this great opportunity to, to discuss and share our knowledge and experience. So today we are going to discuss about hyperglycemic emergencies. The reason to talk, take this topic is, is fairly common. I do see maybe a one or two cases per week. And also, yeah, most of us think, ah, if it's a diabetic ketone, if you give some insulin and give some free, it should be okay. It's not so. We have to, I think now we have, we have a better understanding about the disease. So we have to get on top of, on top of the disease and we have to manage properly and effectively. And if you manage diabetic ketones well, the patient should not die. So during this talk, we will be discussing about how to diagnose a diabetic ketoacidosis and the management principles of DK, a diabetic ketoacidosis and try to break some myths on diabetic ketoacidosis and diagnosis and management of hyposmolar hyperglycemic states and some what are the differences from HHS versus a diabetic ketoacidosis in managing the patient. So let's go through the, the real case. I have, we, go, we have got a 33 year old female present to shortness of breath to the a and &E. He was, uh, <clears throat> he was, uh, she was significantly short of breath. She is asking for oxygen, doctor, I can't breathe. Give oxygen, please. And she has been going to several doctors, being nebulized several times. But unfortunately, so when it comes to the triage, her airway and breathing is quite okay, except she's respiratory dis distress with a respiratory rate of 36, but saturating well. And heart rate was 128 and black pressure is. So these are the parameters. What do you think about these parameters? Are you worried? The striking feature, significantly soreness of breath. There's no significant lung signs and saturation is normal. And also there is a heart rate is tachycardic and narrow pulse pressure, pulse pressure of 20. So is there is any, so what differential has gone through our mind? Is it the metabolic causes giving rise to soreness of breath? like diabetic ketoacidosis or acute kidney injuries or any toxin give rise to acute soreness of breath or tachycardic and tachypneic, is it a pulmonary embolism in a female? So we were very concerned, but the good thing is, even though she's significantly dyspneic, the saturation was normal, so a bit unlikely to be a pulmonary embolism, but you never know. And also, he's having a comp she's having a compensator shock and bit confused as well and in the trial the cbs was high index even temperature was normal 
So the first thing, what do you do? You do a A B G O B B G. The first question comes to our mind when the sugar is high and she is dyspnea and we are worried about diabetic ketoacidosis. First myth: we should do a A B G for this patient. Is it true? What's the difference? What do you what do you get additionally? Or well, what's the difference between the V B G? Only the pH is only slightly different. I mean, by pH and bicarbonate is slightly different, and carbon dioxide is five. But we are looking at the trend. So we prefer to have a VBG. What's the advantage of VBG? It's painless, easy to perform, and puncturing the 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 radial artery is very painful also, and sometimes it can cause a distal artery occlusion as well. So VBG is quite easy to do and less painful. So in a diabetic ketoacidosis, we are more can we are we are we do VBGs. But there are instances we do a ABG, especially if the patient is very bad and patient need a ICU admission, we put a art line to take multiple ABGs, so it's easy. But in Sri Lanka, we quite often do a VBG. So then, what's the, how do you diagnose a diabetic ketoacidosis? So according to the Joint British Diabetic Society, its latest one is recently being published, 2021 guideline. The diagnosis criteria, all three should be there. It's also the mnemonic called DKA. D for the DEXO, the capillary blood sugar should be more than 20 millimole for patient with the diagnosed patient with the diabetic ketoacidosis. Mind you guys, especially in a patient with a diagnosed patient with a diabetic, if she or he is on treatment, they can have a euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. So it's not always mandatory to have a high blood sugar. Second one is ketosis. So there are either of things, ketonuria or ketonemia. The more accurate one is a ketonemia, but unfortunately we don't have a ketone, blood ketone levels to do. But there are strips are there, like a glucometer, you can check the, the, the capillary ketone level. If it's more than three, that's significant. Otherwise, ketone urea, so the ketone bodies in the urine should be more than two plus. Mind you guys, just ketone body positive can be occurred in a vomiting dehydrated patient. So we should have a ketone body more than two plus. So how do you do this? So and other thing is acidosis. The pH is less than 7.3 or the bicarbonate of less than 15 or and or O. So these three should be there. So in a practical scenario, when it comes to an emergency department or when it comes to the ANE or ET or PCU, how do you diagnose? You don't have a luxury to do a ketone body, urine ketone bodies take maybe hours to get patient is significantly ill. So what we do, if the sugar is high or known patient with the diabetic, with acidosis, without any other obvious causes, we could able to diagnose, tentative diagnosis of DKA. But ideally, all three should be there. The ketosis should be there. So in our department, what I do is we have a urine dipstick to check the ketone body. So it's a bedside test. So we could able to check the level as well. So we should have a high degree of suspicion. There are lots of mismanaged or misdiagnosed patients with the diabetic keto as well, being managed with the abdominal pain, acute abdomen, going to the surgical wards, sometimes sort of breath, recurrent uh, repetitive nebulization is being done. So we should be able to remember, yes, this patient is significantly soreness of breath, but lung signs are normal. Is it a diabetic ketoacidosis? So likewise, in abdominal pain with a soft abdomen, also you have to always consider, is it a diabetic ketoacidosis? Regarding the pathophysiology, I know this is the only boring slide I have and congested one, 
but I think as a doctor, we should have basic understanding what's happening in the diabetic ketoacidosis. It's the absolute deficiency in the insulin. So causing um, <clears throat> increase uh, breakdown of the fatty acids, which leads to free fatty acid will be high and leads to ketogenesis. So we use a ketogenesis, which passes in the urine and it's also bind to the bicarbonate and causing acidosis and the ketone body also acidic component, so which give rise to acidosis. And also the um, ketones is an osmotic active substance. So it causes osmotic diuresis. Other than that, because of the insulin deficiency, this causes an increased glucogenesis. So causing a hypoglycemia. So that's also goes to the urine and causing osmotic diuresis. At the end of the day, after the diabetic ketoacidosis, what happens is we have increased ketone bodies producing production and acidosis and osmotic diuresis causing due to a ketone bodies as well as a hyperglycemia and, and sugar in the urine, causing lots of fluid loss and also electrolyte loss. So usually in a diabetic ketoacidosis, nearly 10% loss, water loss, deficit is 10%. So it's a 100 ml per kg. So roughly a six kilo, 60 kilo man is around six liters. And electrolyte loss, the potassium as well as sodium is lost, as they mentioned in the slides. So when we, once we identify diabetic ketosis, we will actively look how severe the disease is. Clinically, whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not, whether hypoxic or not, and how, is, how the conscious is it, is it the GCS is less than 12. So these are the indicators for severe diabetic ketoacidosis. And blood gas, obviously, if there is a significant pH is less than 7, or bicarbonate is less than five, or an end gap is more than six, 16, it shows a high, uh, it's a significantly bad diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperglycemia, hypokalemia, and ketone levels. If you have a ketone body, it can be checked. Then ketone bodies is more than six, also indicate a severe diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, We'll come to the practical stuff. How we are going to manage this patient? We have a patient, 33-year-old, young female, coming to us, significantly dehydrated, in a compensated shock, and significantly dyspneic. So what are the principles of management? There are seven steps, so there are a few steps are there. One is first resuscitating this patient. I will come one by one. And then the fluid replacement, electrolyte replacement or correction, insulin infusion, monitoring the response to the treatment. Look and treat for the precipitant and minimize the complication of diabetic and the treatment. Let's take one by one, the resuscitation of the patient. Yes, obviously, if there is a features of compensated or decompensated shock, we will be giving a fluid boluses to resuscitate them, like 10 to 20 ml per kg until the vitals are being stable. And also, we should be able to correct the fatal electrolyte imbalance, especially a potassium. So just to go through this, this lady, so we have given a fluid bolus and her gas looks very bad. The pH is 6.9 and bicarbonate is less than three. So it's, we don't know whether it's one, two. And also what other striking feature here is the potassium is 7.8 with the sodium of 123. So how, how are we going to correct the potassium here? What's your concern? How we are going to correct? Is it, going, is it a life-threatening concern? Yes, it is. 
So why, how are we going to correct this one? Yes. So we will do a 12 lead ECG check. Is there is any features of hyperkalemia? Then we will be giving an IV calcium gluconate because it's a severe hyperkalemia. So even if there is no ECG changes, we will give a IV calcium gluconate. Then another important thing, when you give it, so usually to reduce the potassium, you shift the potassium intracellularly by giving either insulin dextrose or salbutamol nebulization or if there is acidosis you can give a bicarbonate as well so here if you are you going to give insulin dexose or insulin alone because already the patient is hyperglycemic are you going to give some 50 ml of 50 percent dexose on top of the uh, uh, to try to why so the main reason why we give a dexose to prevent the hypoglycemia so we give a insulin which will shift the potassium from extracellular to intracellular in order to prevent the hypoglycemia we give a dexose so here i won't give a dexose or i will give a small amount of dexose because her glucose was high index so we don't know how high it is so we didn't give a dexose we give just a 10 units of insulin Other concern was sodium, correcting a sodium. What's the sodium level? 123, and she's confused. Is it, are we going to rush through the 3% cell and to correct? Because when you have hyperglycemia, the colloid on cortical pressure goes up and fluids drag into the capillaries. So there is a dilution and hyponatremia. So we don't have to correct that. So we have to go with the corrected sodium corrected sodium is equal to measured sodium plus 2.4 capillary blood sugar minus 100 divided by 4 so her corrected sodium comes very high it's around 138 so we don't have to correct so that's also other mistake we do do so when we see a hyperglycemic patient when you check the sodium level is always it's most of the time is low because of the dilution of hyponatremia we don't have to correct. When we correct the sugars, it will automatically, the, the sodium will get corrected. Then, the CBOID, so in a resuscitation, so we we have replaced the fluid and we have corrected the fatal arrhythmia, mainly the electrolyte imbalance, mainly the, uh, the potassium, which was very high, 7.8. Another one is severe acidosis. What do you do? Do you? Shall we give some bicarbonate or not? What happens? So why do you want to correct with the bicarbonate? The first, there are questions which come. Why do you want to give a bicarbonate? How the bicarbonate help in a diabetic ketoacidosis? Is it really going to help in any acidosis? Especially in a diabetic ketoacidosis, how is it going to help? And is there is any harm of giving bicarbonate so when we give a bicarbonate how it works the bicarbonate binds to the sodium it's become h2o and then with, with the carbonic anhydride it breaks down to h2o and co2 so to neutralize the h plus you should have the patient should be able to breathe out the carbon dioxide so here you would think yeah, this bicarbonate is less than three and carbon dioxide also very low. So we are not worried about carbon dioxide as well. So shall we give a bicarbonate? But why the patient is gistic in a diabetic ketoacidosis is patient want to wash out the carbon dioxide to maintain the pH. So can you see this blood gas? Despite of less carbon dioxide, the pH is 6.9. So carbon dioxide is around 10 and the pH is 6.9. So what had happened if you give a bicarbonate and increase the carbon dioxide by 10, the pH will further reduce. So, and also when you take the H plus, H, compared to the H plus, H plus is iron, but carbon dioxide is having a high solubility. So it easily crosses the 
cells and will cause a intracellular acidosis. So bicarbonate is not indicated most of the insulin. Yes, some guidelines say, yes, give a bicarbonate if the pH is less than 7.1, if O7, but you have to, before giving bicarbonate, you have to think why I am giving a bicarbonate. Is this acidosis is causing a reduced contractility and cardiac instability? Then you might have to consider, yes, if the blood pressure is low due to a cardiac instability or contractility is being affected. So after fluid, causes fluid correction, still the patient blood pressure is low, then you might consider. That's the only incident I would consider in a DK. Otherwise, it will cause more harm than the good. So second myth is don't give, give my, break the myth, don't give a bicarbonate unless it's really, really, really indicated, especially a hemodynamic compromise. The third, so second one, after the resuscitation, the second one comes as a fluid replacement. What's the best fluid? Normal saline, crystalloid, so call it, obviously crystalloid. This is normal saline, or N by two, or dexose, or dexose, uh, DNS dexose with the 5% dexose with the normal saline. The best fluid is a normal saline. Or like, when you compare the both, then, the normal saline and the ringolactate, both are equally effective. And how much of fluid we are going to give? So when you take the fluid replacement, how much of fluid you are going to give it and how fast you are going to give it? So then you can check the, this, the, the guideline. So it's a Joint Society of uh, Diabetic uh, Society guideline. So it says one liter over one hour, one liter over two hours, one liter over two hours, one liter over four hours, and one liter over four hours. Why this, how this, this guideline, the fluid guideline arrives? How it comes from out of blue? How it happens? So why, why you give one liter over one hour, one liter over one hour, two hours? How, how they have arrived this, the fluid regime? Second one, so why? So I, as, as I have mentioned, when you have a diabetic keto, so the fluid loss is around 10% day. So if you take a 60 kilo man, he lost around six liters. So you could see this total fluid amount is six liters. You are giving over nearly 19 hours or 17 hours. So 19 hours. So, so it's a six liters, but if you, Consider as a patient. Now you, your patient is having a pH of 6.9, severe vomiting and diarrhea. You're going to give a same fluid regime to uh, another patient with a pH of 7.25, not significantly ketotic, not significantly acidotic. Are you going to give same cocktail for everyone? Not really. We should tailor me. But you should understand there is a significant fluid losses there we should replace over hour. So that's the most important thing we should be able to understand this disease, right? So it's not like a prescribing a cocktail uh, or the regime for a 19 hour, you give, 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 so no, it's not going to work like this. You have to keep on assessing the fluid status and see. So how you're going to do is the fluid, the main other concern when you give a, a very large amount of fluid, over 19 hours, six liters, you should be, because there may be associated AKI. Is it a pre-renal or renal AKI? Is there any features of fluid overload, acute cardiogenic pulmonary, acute pulmonary edema? So the fluid status assessment is very important before giving or uh, prescribing uh, the fluids. So how do you, Assess the fluid state clinically. You will be assessing the hydration state, the mucous membrane, the tachycardia, the volume of the pulse and the rate and the blood pressure, pulse pressure. And also, the urine output is tricky here because of the osmotic diuresis, the urine output won't reflect the fluid status, not always. But if you see a large amount of urine, I'm a bit happy because there's no significant AKI there. 
And also the point of care ultrasound scan is very important to, to identify. Most of the emergency department or a &E have the point of care ultrasound scan. I will look at the heart, how the heart is contracted, the right ventricle is feeling good or not, hopefully it depleted. I will look at the lungs to see if there is any B-line suggestive of pulmonary edema. And also I will check the IVC to check whether it's collapsible more than 50% or not. So I will take a clinical as well as uh, the point of care ultrasound scan to identify the I can give a fluid status or not. Most of the patients, if you could see, they ask for fluids. I want to drink water, drink once you're getting better, better they want to drink some water, but we will rest it. And we have to be very conscious enough to tailor made the fluid. Because if there is no significant AKI, and if there is no significant acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and if you have lots of facilities to identify the fluid status, I think you have to be judicially give a fluid. Then the third step is electrolyte replacement. I have mentioned the potassium loss is high in a patient with a diabetic ketoacidosis. And also when I give a insulin infusion, the potassium will further drop. by shifting the potassium intracellularly. So even before starting the insulin infusion, I will check the potassium, whether it's between 3.5 to 5.5. Then I will add each fluid regime. I will give a each pint of 500 ml of normal cell and I will add 20 millimoles of KCL. But if it's more, I will withhold for a moment and I will recheck the potassium and I will start. If it's less than 3.5, what, what you're going to do? There are two options I have. One, I won't be starting an insulin infusion. I will give a potassium replacement and reassess and see. Or I might have to put a central line and give a potassium replacement to give a larger amount. So mind you, I rather prefer a neck central axis rather than the femoral vein because there is a risk of getting DVT as well. So the fourth step after starting a potassium, potassium replacement, the fourth step is the insulin infusion. Why do you start insulin? Is it to reduce the sugar or it is reduced in or production of the ketones, inhibit the ketogenesis. Yes, obviously, it's not to reduce the sugar. The main pathology here is not the hyperglycemia. It's a ketogenesis. So we start, we start, we give an insulin infusion to prevent the ketoacidosis. So what's the regime we start? Fixed, do fixed rate insulin, uh, intravenous insulin infusion. So not a variable, not, we don't try to trade the sugar level and give the insulin infusion. No, it's a fixed rate. So we start from a range of 0 0.5 to 0 0.14, 0, sorry, 0, sorry, 0 0.05 to 0.14 unit per kg per hour. So I did most of the time we start at 0.1 unit per kg. So, uh, so, Maybe if it has 60 kilos, we give a six unit per hour. And also, we don't give IV or IM insulin boluses. Yes, we maybe in the past we might have given a 10 unit bolus IV and IM. So we are not going to give that. That's increase the risk of hypoglycemia and hypokalemia. So then insulin infusion. So when we start the insulin infusion with a 0.1 unit per k, kg per hour, like six unit per hour, we have to carefully monitor the hypoglycemia and hyperkalemia. Once the sugar be, become less than 250, and still there is acidosis or ketoacidosis, then I don't reduce the insulin infusion. I continue the same insulin infusion, and also I will separate the start a 10% dexose in a rate of 100 to 125 milliliter per hour. If it further drastically drops, then either I can increase the 
10% dexose or I will reduce the insulin infusion to 0 0.05. So when are you going to stop the insulin infusion? Because here we start the insulin infusion, as I mentioned, to reduce the pH should be made more than seven. So acidosis should be corrected. And if you have a facility, ketosis also should be corrected. And patients should be able to eat and drink. And also we will give a subcut insulin to bridge the therapy. Then after starting insulin and looking for objective, then monitor the response to treatment. Yes, you have to sit with the patient and manage like a dengue patient. You have to sit and monitor and observe and see the response. You can't write for 24 hours or 10 hour regime and go wrong. It's not going to work like in a diabetic keto, severe diabetic keto acidosis. So we are going to monitor a clinical parameters and also there are targets, bicarbonate target, capillary blood sugar target and ketone body target if you have a capillary ketone level. But in our setup, what's the most easiest and good way to identify if you have a chlorine in your blood gas, the anion gap. The anion gap is directly reflect the amount of ketone in your blood. So that's a, one of the important tools to identify whether you are giving adequate treatment. So if there is an in, inadequate correction of the metabolic acidosis, there are several causes you have to think inadequate dose of insulin, inadequate free re replacement, is there an associated sepsis or septic shock is there, or is a hyperchloremic normal anion gap metabolic acidosis due to a normal saline induced, or is there is any acute kidney injury also there that can't give rise to AKI. So then, looking at monitoring the treatment, then you have to identify if there is obvious precipitant and treat it. So is it due to poor compliance or due to a concurrent infection or acute coronary syndrome or pancreatitis? You have to look for those things. So you could see, so are you going to give an empirical antibiotic for all of the patients? The answer is no. You could see here also that the, the white cell is 24,000 with a neutrophil of 19, so it's a neutrophil leukocytosis that can be occurred due to a diabetic ketoacidosis even without infection. Other cell lines also increase because of the de dehydration and diabetic ketoacidosis. So if there is a clinically or biochemically like CRP is right, then we would be able to give antibiotic. So minimize the complication. So I will look for the complications of the diabetic ketoacidosis and also I will look for the complication, what are the complications due to my treatment. So the diabetic ketoacidosis is an AKI, cerebral edema or venous thromboembolism. Due to treatment, is it any hypoglycemia, hypokalemia or hyperkalemia and fluid overload. So there is, a, if there is no obvious contraindication, I would consider to give a parenteral anticoagulation in oxaparin as a DVT prophylaxis if there is no contraindication. Just to have a word, intubating a diabetic ketoacidosis because sometimes they are significantly dyspneic or sometimes they are confused and vomiting, you are worried about airway, securing airway, but unless it's really, really indicated, I would rather postpone the diabetic keto injection. Uh, intubating a diabetic keto acid. Why? What are the concerns? You could see this patient's a pH is 6.9. Bicarbonate is less than 3 and with the POCO2 is 11. So when you give, once you give an induction and paralytic agent like a midazolam and saxamidin, he she, she will stop breathing. So carbon dioxide will pile up. So it will worsen the acidosis and it will cause a cardiac arrest. And also, you could see this patient is fully respiratory, try to compensate. So carbon dioxide is 10 by all the effort. Maybe she's breathing minute, uh, the tidal volume of 600 with the rate of 35, so it's 40. So it may be a, uh, maybe she's breathing nearly 20 liter per minute. 
in a negative pressure ventilation. Can you give a 20 liters in a minute in a positive pressure ventilation? No, it will cause a barrow volume trauma and also it will drastically reduce the blood pressure. So you won't be able to match her respiratory, respiratory compromise when you intubate and give a positive pressure. So the background news is if you want to intubate, always consider really indicated, call for help, resuscitate, fully resuscitate, and get an experienced person to intubate. So how, just a word, how the pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis is different from diadult, the mainly the principle is the same. The main concern is that it's a risk of cerebral edema. So careful IV fluid replacement, and also reduction also carefully we reduce uh, sugars because it will, if it drastically reduces sugars, then it will reduce the osmotic pressure drastically and increase the cerebral edema. And almost we don't, never we give a sodium bicarbonate in diabetic ketoacidosis, in pediatric diabetic ketoacidosis. That's the main difference. Most of the treatment are being designed for diabetic ketoacidosis in pediatric is to prevent or minimize cerebral edema other than the usual management. So we usually stick in a pediatric one BSPED guideline. So because I'm not going to discuss more detail because this is out of scope of our topic and it's a big topic in a pediatric DK. The main thing is a cerebral edema. Relatively, the cerebral edema is less in adult. We'll quick, quickly move to the next case. A 76-year-old lady presents with a confusion. On examination, she's dehydrated, severely dehydrated and tachycardic. CBS was high index. We did a VBG. There's no acidosis, but sodium is 165. What's next? That's your diagnosis. So, what's the hyperglycemic, hyper or smaller state? It occurs in elderly, especially with the type 2 diabetic and high mortality than the DK. Deaths are due to more due to complications and often associated with uh, triggers. So how do you diagnose a diabetic ketoacidosis? Sorry, HHS. So there should be a four criteria. Mark hyperglycemia. The sugar is more than 140. Sorry, 540. So or high index, or small alti more than 320, hypovolemia, and there's no significant acidosis or ketonemia. But when it comes to practical scenario, we won't be able to get, get the small alti quickly. It's take care of, so some hospital, they don't have, we don't have a os, small alti, serum or small alti. So how do you diagnose them? And also sometimes there may be acidosis because of the sepsis. So how do you diagnose? So if there is a marked hyperglycemia with a high degree of suspicion, so how do you suspect? So history of type two diabetic and severely dehydrated with altered mental state with the hyperglycemic and high osmolality. So correct. So we can do a calculated osmolality by two sodium glucose or blood urea. Again, blood urea takes some time. So if there is a high sodium with a hyperglycemia in a dehydrated patient with a diabetic background history of diabetic, then I will start treating as a HHS. So principles of uh, HHS is normalizing the osmolality and replace the fluids and electrolyte, normalizing the blood sugar, prevent the complications and treat the precipitant. So here, the normalizing osmolality and uh, uh, electrolyte, here we go for a slow correction. We are not rushing to correct the sodium rapidly or the osmolality rapidly over the 48 hours. Then the fluid replacement, the amount of fluid, because here the, compared to DKA, the fluid loss, the dehydration much more than the DKA because of the long process. So they lose around 10 to 20 ml per kg, sorry, 10 to 20 percentage, which is 100 to 220 ml per kg. But 
we won't be able to give a enormous fluid because they may be as elderly patient, may be associated with AKI, may be a heart disease. So we have to be cautious to give a fluid as well. So that's a balance. What's the best fluid? Sodium is high. Do you want to give an N by two saline or normal saline? The standard is giving a normal saline. So usually normal saline and starting a insulin will correct the sodium. If it's not corrected only, I will consider N by two. So the first thing, the best fluid in a HHS is normal saline. Then insulin infusion. Here we don't rush for the insulin infusion. Sometime after correcting a fluids, the sugar comes down. And it's also not an insulin resistant state. They respond to even the small amount of insulin. So we give a lower dose after fluid replacement. Also, if the sugar is high, then we will give a uh, insulin infusions. <clears throat> Other thing I want to highlight, if the sugar is high index, please send a plasma or a venous sample for plasma sugar. Then, Because if it's high index, it's more than 500. We never know it's 2000 or 1000 or just a 600. So it's always wise to send the sample for a blood blood sugar to the lab. Then most of the patients are associated with the precipitant. So identify and treat, especially an infection or maybe a poor compliance. So why is poor compliance? Identify and educate them and start a regular doses as well. That's also important. And treating a complication. Here the venous thromboembolism is very high. Starting in anticoagulation is very important if there is no significant contraindication, especially a renal acute kidney injury or bleeding manifestation. And AKI, so these are the other complications. And also complications of treatment or iatrogenic also we have to check. So there are a few words about. Now we have a patient, a severely septic shock patient coming with a high blood sugar and she's known patient with a diabetic as well. But there's no evidence suggestive of DKA or HSS. So how you are going to control the sugar? So if there's no HSS or this one, if the patient is significantly ill, like a STEMI or in an intubated uh, critically ill patient, so then we go for a variable rate of insulin infusion. We try to, because here we correct the sugar, not other things. So we try it according to the blood sugar level. So there are algo one, algo two, algo three there. So we will be correcting a variable rate, not like a fixed rate, like a six unit per kg per hour. So six unit per hour. So not like this. Here it's a variable rate. There are charts are there. You could able to check and start the infusion. And target capillary blood sugar is 100 to 180. And we quite often see, or we do get lots of referral from uh, sending to us in a clinic, high sugar, they admit to us. So, but if there is no evidence of HHS or diabetic ketoacidosis, and if they are not critically ill, how do you manage the hyperglycemia? Do you really want to start an insulin infusion? Answer is no. Because if you insulin infusion, there's a risk of hypoglycemia, and also they get hypokalemia and get a muscular cramps. So it's, uh, IV infusions are not recommended for just to manage the hyperglycemia. And also, there may be hyperglycemia for month. You don't have to rush to reduce. So you have to identify why they are hypoglycemic and also you have to actively look if there is any features of HHS or DKA clinically. We are not going to do all the patient at uh, VBG to check uh, clinically how they breathe and how clinically it looks like and see. So question, I think we will be taking a question after this. And to sum up, so in a diabetic ketoacidosis, the fluid replacement and electrolyte correction are essential. Diabetic ketoacidosis, insulin infusion is given to inhibit the ketoacidosis, not to control or reduce the sugar. Only very rarely the bicarbonate is indicated in a diabetic ketoacidosis. So before giving a bicarbonate, think twice, call for help. 
hypoglycemia and hypokalemia are serious complications of treat of the treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis. So we have to observe carefully. Careful full fluid replacement is essential and important step in an HHS. And hyperglycemia, all the hyperglycemia doesn't need an insulin infusion. Thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for that very comprehensive lecture on hyperglycemia So I will, I will go ahead with a couple of questions that we have got from our participants. Uh, the first question is, sir, can DKA occur in type two diabetes? That's interesting. Yeah, even though it's common in a type 1 diabetic, yes, we quite often see a type 2 diabetic patient coming with the uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. So, yes, it's common. It's, it's, it happens because of the high resistance. It's almost like a presence, like an absolute deficiency. Yes, so it can occur in type 2 diabetics. Diabetic ketoacidosis can occur in that type 2 diabetic. Uh, diabetic. Uh, the next question, sir. In diabetic ketoacidosis, since there is an absolute insulin deficit, can there be hypokalemia and also the reduced ECF volume? Will it also compensate this? And uh, if so, can the patient have hypokalemia as mentioned by you? Hypokalemia. So the patient can come with the yes. So in a diabetic ketoacidosis, when they present, they can come with all three incidents. They can come with the hyperkalemia and normal kalemia and also hypokalemia. Yes, I do agree because of the loss of the fluid. Also, they may be having a normal level. But the osmotic diuresis, because of the osmotic diuresis, there is a osmotic, sorry, the concentration gradient of the pot potassium in the renal tubules are loss. So there will be a loss of electrolyte loss. But they will be falsely, they may be a U uh, or hypokalemic or sometimes hyperkalemic or eukalemic because of the insulin deficiency, the extracellular potassium will come out from the uh, from intracellular cal calcium is shifted to the extracellularly. Is already in fluid overload, how do we resuscitate according to the regime? Yes, so then if there is a fluid overload, then we are not going to stick to the fluid regime. So it should be a clinical assessment of the fluid status and also uh, uh, ultrasonically, a uh, point of care ultrasound scan is very important. So if there is a fluid overload, that's a real indication to. Patients should be managed in the resuscitation area in the emergency department or any, and also it's an indication for going for a uh, ICU care, critical care. So there is a, a tailor-made regime we have to go. So we are not going to stick to the, the usual fluid regime if there is a fluid overload. And so there is also a request for a brief summary on the management differences of DKA compared to HHS. Right. So, yes, so the first difference is in HHS is you tend to give more cautiously giving a fluid. So most of the time the fluid will correct the disease. If there is no response only, we will give a smaller amount of uh, diabetes, sorry, insulin infusion compared to in a D, DK, we give a 0.1 unit per kg per hour, whereas in HHS, we give a half the dead dose if needed only first thing. And second one, um, so it's, it's a, not an insulin resistance. That's the other reason we give a lower dose. And also second one, the venous thromboembolism is very high in a, uh, in a patient with HHS. So we tend to go more venous thromboembolism prophylaxis as well. So... Uh, 
other thing is that the, the fluid loss is very high or dehydration or fluid deficit is very high. So we have to correct the fluid. We might have to give a larger fluid, large amount of fluid over a quite a number of time, provided that most of the patients are elderly, maybe associated with the kidney disease and heart disease. So we have to give cautiously as well. So these are the main difference when we come to managing the patient with the HHS and DKA. Uh, there is also a request to emphasize on the best type of fluid to resuscitating DKA. So to resuscitate the fluid, yes, if there is a compensator or decompensator, so fluid shock. So then the best fluid is the normal cell line. Then to replace the fluid, there are lots of studies being done whether comparing more physiological fluid like a ringolactate or plasma light and also comparing a normal saline. But ringolactate is not superior compared to the normal saline. So you can give either of them. Okay, next question, sir. If the systolic blood pressure is more than 90, would you start fluid regime and insulin infection infusion together? Or would you give one liter of fluid and then start insulin? Right. So I think there are a lot of, uh, so we also tend to confuse with the pediatric versus adult and as well. So here, if there is a hypotension or if the blood pressure is being stable, I will start the fluid. And also, if there's no hypokalemia, then I will start the insulin infusion as well as at the same time. So we don't have to wait for a one hour to start uh, the insulin infusion because insulin is very essential in a management and it takes some time to act as well. So we start the insulin infusion provided that there's no hypokalemia. But in, in a pediatric one, we don't want to drastically drop the sugar that can increase the cerebral edema. So we tend to give a one liter fluid and then after one hour, we start the um, insulin infusion. That's the main difference compared to the pediatric and other. So the next question, could you please touch on the effects of BKA on the fetus in a pregnant lady? Yes. So the, the effects of DKA in a fetus is, I think it's, I think it's still is not where commonly being studied, but usually it's safe. The hyperglycemia, teratogenicity and other effects are there, but this is a very acute presentation. So usually they are safe, but if there is a significant acidosis, it can cross the plasma, uh, so placenta as well as, and it can cause affect the heart. But usually the diabetic, the pregnant mother, the, the fetus do better, but when it comes to the fluid management, it's always challenging the diabetic ketoacidosis in a in a GDM patient, but it's not very common presentation as well. It's not very common. Another question concerning that: uh, they are requesting a word about, about a pregnant lady with GDM coming to the emergency department with high blood sugar. So, pregnant lady with the GDM coming with the high blood sugar. So the first, the principles are same. So if the pregnant mother comes to you, if there is, I will look for any life threatening emergency. So the, such as whether, compare, so I will look at the mother and the fetus. So when it comes to the mother, if the patient is having a diabetic ketoacidosis or HHS, HHS is a bit rare in a pregnant mother. So in a diabetic ketoacidosis, they are not. If there's no diabetic ketosis, they're just a hyperglycemia. Then I will quickly look at the fetus, whether it's a fetus is in distress or any other features. Then we will slowly come down the sugar with the subcut insulin. There's no reason to rush to reduce the sugar immediately by starting insulin infusion. We have a very practical question, sir. Yeah. They are requesting to know what the very first investigation in HHS in a ward setting, whether it is serum or smolality. Unfortunately, most of the hospital, we don't have a serum osmolality. So what I will do, the very first test I will do in a high index sugar. First thing is a capillary blood sugar. Then I will do a VBG. First thing, whether there is any 
diabetic ketosis is there or not. And other reason I will do a VBG to check the sodium level. Usually a hyperglycemic patient, I expect a low sodium. If I see a sodium is high, even 150, I'm worried because the corrected sodium is going to be very high. And I will send the blood jury and I will do a, I will do a correct, uh, so calculated or measured osmolarity rather than, uh, uh, sorry, calculated osmolarity rather than the measure because it takes time or the availability. So I would say capillary blood sugar and the BBG to start with, then I will show the blood panel, including the uh, renal function, blood jury, and the creatinine. Next question, sir, how can modification be intubation in DKA? Yes, this is a bit of advanced question, so I, I purposely avoid it. So, but yes, in a bad day, you never know. So even though we say try to avoid the intubation, it happens. Yeah, you have to intubate. So, what what are the modifications? If you try to understand the principles, so the first thing when you give a induction agent and paralytic agent, if you patient stop breathing, I might give a bag valve, a small tidal volume because there is a risk of gastroparesis and vomiting as well. So I will give a bag valve and give a small tidal volume until I intubate. And the intubation should be done by a quick and experienced person. Before intubating this patient, I will do a fluid correction and try to identify, start the insulin infusion, try to optimize the fluid status because high risk of peri-intubation cardiac arrest. Then I will try to maximize to give a tidal volume and the minute volume to match this one. So before intubation, I will repeat the gas and after intubation also I will repeat the gas and let's see if there is any worsening. So these are the modification I will consider. Next question, sir. What happens to total sodium triglyceride levels in DKA? Uh, total, I'm not quite sure about that. So we don't check the total triglyceride level, but if there is a triglyceride is high, then the sodium will be forced, the pseudo hyponatrium will happen. I'm not quite sure about what will happen to the triglyceride. Next question, sir. In patients with DKA, there are absolute deficiency in potassium level in the body. Obviously, as I have mentioned, they lost the potassium nearly three to five millimole per kg. So it's a significant loss because of the osmotic diuresis. So they lose with the, the gradient between the, the tubules and the uh, capillary is being lost because of the washout phenomenon. So there is obvious deficiency. But there may be a uh, you because of the intracellular potassium comes out. So that's why sometimes the potassium looks normal. So the real potassium, total potassium is depleted. Next question, how do we manage a patient with high RBS without DKA or HHS in a well mobile patient? Yeah, I think I have mentioned it in my slide as well. So if there is a, no, complications and patient is not critically ill. You can even start a subcut insulin or even oral hypoglycemic you can manage if, if the patient's education level is good and you have outpatient department to run and good GP setup, yes, you can manage with the regular follow-up. Another practical question, sir. How can we manage a suspecting DKA or HHS patient in a GP setup if the hospital is far away? Yeah. So I would say a diabetic ketoacidosis, managing a diabetic ketoacidosis is going to be a very challenging as outpatient. Even though in a Western country with a very good GP setup, they tend to, even with that also, they tend to send to the emergency department. So it's very challenging, but if there is a slight, so I would say quickly, if you have a facility to check the sugars and also if you have a gas or electrolyte, if you could check then see if there is any life-threatening emergency, especially if the patient is in shock, give some fluid before transferring to us. And also if there is a hyperkalemia, you might have to give some pot, uh, to stabilize a, uh, potassium. But as an outpatient managing a diabetic ketoacidosis and HHS, obviously HHS is a high mortality, we won't recommend 
as managing as outpatient in Sri Lanka. Next question, sir. If the blood pressure is resistant to fluid therapy, what inotropes can we start? Yes. So if it's resistant to fluid therapy, then we might have to think what's the main reason the patient is, is it a cardiac involvement or is it an acidosis is causing inhibition? Or still we are underhydrated in the patient? Or is there any medication I'm giving causing a high, uh, low blood pressure? Or any associated acute myocardial infarction or acute coronary syndrome, which give rise to this one. So I will particularly look why this patient is hypotensive. Or is there associated septic shock is there? So I will try to correct it, but the, if the heart rate is quite okay, the best inotope to start with in you know, a through the peripheral line, I would say it's a no adrenaline infusion. Next question. Once the RDS is around 250, do we have to continue the same insulin rate? I think I have mentioned in my slide as well, just to again go through it. So if the sugars comes down less than 250 and also if the pH is high and acid pH is low and if there's a bicarbonate is low, if there is a significant ketoacidosis, I will recommend to continue the insulin infusion, same insulin infusion. On top of that, other, come other, you start the 10% dexose on top of the normal fluid regime. So maybe a 100 to 125 ml per Despite of that also, if the sugars comes down, then I will half down my insulin infusion rate. Uh, next question, sir. Uh, can you please explain about how giving bicarbonate can affect badly? I think I have mentioned this one. Yes, yes, I know. Lots of, uh, yeah, we have, a, when you look at the blood gas, we have a urge to give bicarbonate but because bicarbonate is very low and you would see the carbon dioxide is not high if it if there is a production of carbon dioxide you don't have to worry but the thing if you give a bicarbonate the patient is putting all the effort to wash out the carbon dioxide so if you give us you are going to give some more carbon dioxide and also to breathe more faster it's not going to happen so the carbon dioxide goes up even if it increased from a 10 to 20, that will cause the intracellular acidosis and worsen the this one. So it's not going to help in a great deal. So before giving a bicarbonate, please think, why are you giving a bicarbonate? Just to correct the investigation or really this patient clinically indicated? Especially, I would recommend only if there is a hemodynamic instability. In adult, in a, in a pediatric, there are lots of other reasons, the sodium, High sodium is not good and also it causes the cerebral edema as well. So I think that principles, all the principles apply for the adult patient as well. We don't want to overload the patient with the sodium and other applied as well. So main reason is intracellular acidosis and it's not going to do any good in a fully maximally compensated, respiratory compensated patient. I think we have one final question, sir. Okay. How to or when to convert fixed-dose insulin regime to subcut insulin in a patient with PKA? Yes, I, I think I have mentioned that in the slide also. Just, uh, so if the pH is being corrected, so if the pH is more than 7.3 and bicarbonate is more than 15 and also if, they, if you have a ketone body in the blood, you can check because you can't repeat the ketone body in the urine because once it's positive, it will be positive for 24 to 48 hours. So it's not going to be a point of care check to uh, identify the uh, treatment state. So if you have a facility of capillary ketone bodies, it should be less than 0.6. And also patients should be clinically well, able to eat and drink. Then we will start a subcut insulin Bridget, and I will continue the insulin infusion for another half an hour, and then I will stop it. We have time for one more question. The last one: uh, When should we start the insulin infusion for the patient? How frequently to check the CBS? CBS should be checked hourly, and initial early part I would recommend to have a VBG hourly, 
and if there's a critically ill patient i would go for hourly if there's a facility otherwise vbg for two hourly or the electrolyte should be two hourly vbg i check the vbg not only check the acid base but i also checking the potassium as well so i'm checking the electrolyte also so we will have to regularly check Thank you very much. And thank you for burning questions as well.